Well, how are y'all doing today? Good. Good. Hey. Um, so I am here a little to talk to y'all a little bit about frontier medicine or every man his own doctor, um, which is actually the title. Do you want to pull that up? Um, of uh, actually two uh, separate volumes, and to be honest, I can't remember uh, which date which is, but those are these are both from about the 1740s, 1750s. Um, so this is the kind of book that you would find potentially in homesteads here in the early valley um, in the back country of Virginia. And um, you'll see a little bit later why, but this would be an important document or an important item in just about every household here in the back country. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about cures from fields, forests, and kitchen gardens, and a little bit about medicine in general. So when we're looking at a short history of medicine, um, you all might be familiar with the concept of balancing humors. Um, and this is something that um, when we're looking at ancient medicine, it's actually a step above the beliefs that you saw very early on in human history. So who last had a, an illness or a or cough or a sniffle? You don't have to. You can raise your hand if you want. <laughs> if you don't, I'll just pick on this person. Um, you had a tickle in your throat and, and some trouble breathing the other day, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> you were being punished by the gods. That really is what a lot of early medicine is about. So when I say that the doctrine of the humor of humors is a step above, I mean, that's, that's kind of better than just being like, I don't know why I'm sick, something, you know, I, I've done something to anger one of the gods. Um, and those, um, the other thing that we see with Hippocrates also, and this is something that people are often familiar with even still today, is he has the concept that your, um, uh, let your medicine be your food and your food be your medicine. And that is something that we've come back to back and forth throughout history. Um, now, uh, with you know several of these these slides are going to be some interesting images so as this is recorded and later if anyone's inter interested in having any of this it'll be available it's fine to share that if anyone's interested in it um, i am not going to read everyone all of the information on every single one of these slides also uh, so um beyond the concept of humors all right, we start looking um, with Galen into physiology and anatomy. Now, the problem for Galen, who was um, influenced by Hippocrates as well, so a lot of times in science, you have that people standing on the shoulders of others, right? Um, Galen uh, was interested in anatomy, but was not allowed to basically explore anatomy in the way in which surgeons today can. And that's actually going to be the case case for a lot of history. There's frequently laws preventing human dissection, um, uh, which is kind of important for surgeons to be able to study. Um, also, there are times when there are laws against it and people go against the, you know, break the law. Um, and there are certainly times throughout human history where you will see, or pardon me, the history of the Valley and colonial Virginia, where you will see people breaking that law and going in to remove oppressed peoples from, from cemeteries. So if you can't go and dig somebody up, somebody's probably not going to get that much after you if you dig up an enslaved person. So we, this is something that we will see with this study of anatomy throughout history. But let's go way back to Galen. This, by the way, is a medieval um, uh, image. Um, this is the wound man, and it shows all of the various wounds that could be um, seen on a human body, which was often the only way somebody could study anatomy without dissection, um, if that makes sense. Um, now, when we're looking at wounds, 
How would you care for wounds, do you think, in the past? What's what's a really common method, or not just wounds, pardon me, illnesses as well? Bleeding. Any guesses? So, well, we're first going to look at those humors, right? And then we're going to look at the practices that follow those humors. And yeah, a big one is bloodletting. So who would like to offer up <laughs> to Carson to be bloodlet? <laughs> I know a few people in the audience. So I'm not just put on them until y'all are ready. Okay, so Megan, if you could uh -oh. please stand up here, we'll just make you come to the front. Um, she's also a Frontier Culture Museum. <laughs> okay, so Carson is going to pull up her sleeve. All right, and find. What, an artery or a vein? Brain. Brain. A vein. Brain. Okay, so most bloodletting is going to be done through venesection, which is much safer mm -hmm. than actually arteriosection. That does occasionally happen in this time period, but venesection, you actually end up giving less blood than you do when you give blood today um, in most cases. So, but... I think we have rules against getting blood on the products. So we'll <laughs> now, your other your other treatments in this time period include, um, um, uh, you know, causing vomiting, purging, and catharsis, the laxative effect, sweating, blistering compounds. Um, we can go ahead and give you a blister right here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, diuretics. What are diuretics? Yeah. Things that make you pee. Yes. So basically, if it doesn't come out up here, it will come out here, here, or here. Is really <laughs> what most of these these um, are. Uh, so, and this is this is just a great image. A lot of the images, by the way, that I got from for this um, come from the Wellcome collection, which is a medical library in England. Um, so with bloodletting, a big part of this is, let's say you have a headache. Well, then your humors are out of balance because you know your food is liquefied in your stomach. It's delivered to the liver where it becomes blood, right? <laughs> That's how it works. Um, so an excess of blood could cause fevers, headaches, and, and that sort of thing. Um, when we're looking at how they're going to let blood. I've already discussed it a little bit. Um, mostly venesection using a lancet. Um, the big knife that we had is not actually the lancet. The lancet's much smaller. Um, also blistering and scarification. And then the favorite one for most people when they're looking at historic medicine. Leeches. 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 So um, it's been a while, I think, since they've had leeches at the apothecary at Colonial Williamsburg. And that is one of the places I worked at when um, I first started my, my career. I was an assistant in the apothecary, not one of the uh, folks in the apothecary. Um, but they would frequently get asked to show the leeches. Um, and the leeches had to be fed. Mm. About every six months or so, it would have to be put on somebody's arm in order to feed the leech, because if you don't feed the leech, they're not going to survive. Um, and when we're looking at medicine today, leeches are still used. Does anyone have any idea how leeches are still used? Take down swelling? It can be used for taking down swelling. One of the biggest things for it, when a leech attaches to you, they emit in their saliva enzymes that keep your blood from clotting to keep you bleeding. Um, and so in certain cases, they, they want to keep the blood flowing, especially if you're looking at reattachment surgery. So when your reattachment surgery is first done, they, in certain cases, I don't think it's super widespread, will apply leeches. Now, another small squirmy thing that they use today that they did not use in the past. Any guesses? Mm. Maggots. Maggots. Oh. Maggots, yes. If you have a, um, oh, uh, like, 
what is the thing? No, I'm just throwing a blank. Um, Burns, and then also, uh, gangrene? yeah. Somebody just said it. Gangrene, um, yeah, or when, if you get bitten by, um, like, any kind of flesh decay, because the maggot isn't going to go in and eat good flesh. They actually eat the decayed flesh. So I know it sounds super gross, but it's very effective and still um, a, a, a a source where we're we're using animals for our cure. It's always my goal to gross people out. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Um, now, this one should be really fun for <laughs> the growing out. Um, you don't see a ton of leech usage in the 18th century, even though that is what people tend to think of. They are using them occasionally, but bloodletting tends to be the most common method of getting your blood out for restoring those tumors. S leeches tend to be a little bit more popular in the 19th century. So a potential job for women, and I always like to point out to people that in the past, women worked, ladies didn't. Um, so women in this situation are doing this because they have to, they have no choice. Um, but they could make a decent amount of money going in, hitching up their skirts in a pond, and getting leeches attached to their legs, and then they would be collected in jars and sold to apothecaries. And as this increases in popularity in the 19th century, they stop using women for this job and using horses. These are horses that are kind of on their, I don't mean to be punny here, last legs. Um, uh, but um, I guess I was punny. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the unfortunate thing is those horses would typically not fare well after going into these ponds. But the reason for that is there's a lot more square footage for those leeches to attach to. And when I say this is popular, when it's that popular, there's quite a bit of demand for those. Um, this Most of these leech ponds, by the way, are in France and Germany with the occasional ones in England. Um, I am personally not familiar with tons of leech ponds in the Americas. That doesn't mean it didn't exist. Um, but for a lot of the, the medical field, this was the source of it. Um, and this image comes from Yorkshire, uh, England. Uh, now, another part of... Um, popular medicine in this time period. And this would be something that you would see frequently with this every man his own physician or a lot of home cures is the idea that if you see something in nature that looks like a human part of anatomy, then it might be helpful for that part of human anatomy. Um, so this is an image here of a mandrake. And that helps man things. Um, and then, <laughs> and then um, this here is an image of eye bright. Um, another thing that's frequently used for eye medicine is clary sage. Clary sounds like clary, right? Um, and so um, some of this is doubtful nowadays, but some of it actually kind of makes sense because one of the things that we see with the doctrine of signatures is there's a, a, a nut that looks like your brain. What is it? Walnuts, right? Walnuts look like the human brain. So it was often thought that a walnut could help your brain. Well, what do walnuts have a lot of? Right? Um, the myelin sheath that coats your, your neurons is fatty tissue. That's why when our children are really little, we try to get them to drink like whole milk instead of skim milk kind of deal. So it probably makes sense. Now, is that a cure for something wrong with your brain? No, but it is something that ultimately is not going to be unhealthy for you to consume. Um, now, who's going to treat you? Any guesses? Let's see. You're sick. Who's the first person you're going to? You don't get to answer. Your mother. Your mom. Your mother. <laughs> it's my son. Um, yeah, your mother. So, the, or your father nowadays. So, your mother is the first person you're going to go to. Um, all right. So, once your mother can't help you out, who are you going to go to next? Give you some choices. 
So the next person that you go to, most of us do this. I've got a cold um, and I don't know it's, it's bronchitis, right? But I don't know quite yet. I'm not going to go immediately to the doctor. I'm going to go to CVS or Rite Aid. Um, in this time period, you're going to go in places where they're available. So like out in the frontier, that's not going to be quite as often available. You're going to go to an apothecary. Um, so apothecary is basically a pharmacist. Um, and they do have pills in this time period. There are pill making machines. I really wish we had one. It'd be kind of cool. But um, you can make pills. They also do mixed compound medicines, just like pharmacists today mix compound medicines for you. The big difference between going to an apothecary today and going to a pharmacy in the past. Any, any guesses? Does anyone know? What was that? <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm putting everyone in the spot. Um, okay, can you go to the uh, pharmacy and get laudanum or morphine? <laughs> no, no. No, right? um, if you could afford it, now some of these drugs are cost prohibitive, but if you can afford it, you can get whatever you want. It's not until 1910 with the Food and Drug Administration that there are laws against being able to get whatever you want medically. Um, for most people in the past, again, though, it's going to be cost prohibitive for them to be able to get whatever they want. But there's no prescription. You don't have to get in, in this time period compared to today. Um, the physician is the equal to a doctor, um, and not everybody is going to go to that person. Um, they're not always as trusted, um, and they're also going to be more expensive. The surgeon, more people won't go to if they have the need. Um, that might also be where you can get your blood blood. The major difference between a surgeon and a physician is one is a gentleman and one is not. Mm -hmm. Which one is the gentleman? The surgeon. The physician. The surgeon works with their hands, which is a ridiculous notion, but you know that's that's what we see in the 18th century. If you work with your hands, you're not considered a gentleman. So the physician is going to, in larger cities in Europe, quite possibly be trained in a medical school. We don't see medical schools in the colonies until much later. And um, the College of Medicine in Pennsylvania, I believe is one of the early ones. Um, and, and they're not training surgeons. There is a time period where surgeons and barbers quite often do the same job, but in the early part of the 18th century, those two um, basically professions are separated. Um, but when you used to see the red and white barber pole at a barber shop, that is, is generally why. Now, I'm leaving some other people off of this. Who am I leaving off on this? Nurses. Yes. Um, and, and women are helping nurse, really, right? But who? I heard it. Midwives, right? Um, yeah. So a midwife um, is also going to be frequently seen typically more by women or giving birth. Um, and then there's one more important person I left off of here. Priest and spiritual. No. Although with certain cultures, yes, spirituality and priest. Um, I tend to not get too much into that because there are lanes that I shouldn't be traveling in. Um, nope, we're missing an important person. They work with hot iron. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, the person looks like their tooth removed. Oh, anyone? Anyone? No. <laughs> yeah. She's having a yeah. Let's go in there. Yeah. So, you're going to go in there, you're going to attach the tooth to this and turn and pull it out. Uh, now, it's not frequent, but there are cases where people will occasionally go to a blacksmith to have some of these sorts of tools used on them. Um, so uh, generally speaking, these are who you are going to go to next. <laughs> I actually love this image. Um, and uh, this this is, is kind of quack medicine at its best um, in, the, uh, uh, in the early 19th century kind of deal. Um, 
So medicines, though, that you most often are going to get, especially here in the back country, are going to come from home. These are going to be the things that I have up here, which you guys can come and look at um, towards the end. Um, but we're going to have some very important medicines in here. So who gets migraines? Yeah, me too, right? Fever fever. That is something, and also it can help your fever. So these medicines are growing in your kitchen gardens and, and that sort of, you know, occasionally in your field. Anyone know what this is? Okay. Tobacco. Tobacco can be used medicinally. Um, in fact, I personally remember when I was little, if we got a bee sting, anyone get this when they were little, mm -hmm. to take tobacco and rub it on your bee sting? It actually worked. I don't know why, but or maybe maybe it was just suggested. <laughs> so, um, but you know, you don't have much medical help nearby, um, and physicians are more often not in the middle of the backcountry, and typically are going to be a last resort. You're more likely going to be going to a local um, midwife healer kind of thing um, than a physician. And the medicines that are available are very few or often expensive. In the middle of the 18th century, you do start to see um, different medicines appearing for treating things that um, are using very rare substances or very um, uh, unplant-like substances. For instance, mercury was frequently used as a treatment for syphilis. Um, now, the first cash crop in Virginia is not this. It's sassafras. Anyone familiar with sassafras? Um, so sassafras is being shipped out of Jamestown by by um, the men working the ships who were not part of the Virginia Company, and um, they shipped so much sassafras root back to England that they bought in the market on it. Um, but sassafras also was thought to cure syphilis. Neither mercury nor sassafras will work for that. Sassafras is great, though, for an upset tummy. Um, mercury is not good. I have a question. Um, yes. Why were physicians not always trusted? It's, it's really just kind of a thing of, for wealthy people, they're available and they're most likely trusted. So like the king is going to have his own physicians. But for average people, it, it's not always, they're not getting much of a diagnosis, right? That they don't, and they don't treat you. Again, they're gentlemen, so right. they're only going to give you a diagnosis, and then they're going to send you off potentially to a surgeon or an apothecary. Um, let me ask this question. Who's gone to the doctor and not gotten a diagnosis? Yeah. Everyone pretty much hates you. Yeah. You ever go and I'm like, I got this rash, and I don't know where it came from. Um, and we trust physicians now, um, but they can't like always always give a diagnosis even today. So if you can imagine what it would have been like in this time period where much less is known, there was a, a more common thing of them not being able to give an accurate diagnosis. Kind of deal. Um, and the problem that we're going to see in this time period for a lot of disease um, diagnosis, prevention, and treatment, um, and especially in surgery, is, um, let's see, you need your leg cut off, right? <laughs> and you have you have a wound, and you need your leg cut off. So first, <laughs> first, <laughs> all right, because this is an expensive saw. So we're not going to start going in there and chopping away. We're going to go in and cut and remove parts of your flesh to get to that bone, and then. Use this. Hmm. Now, this material is made out of surgical steel and it's very expensive. So, once I've used this, I am going to clean it off because it's expensive. What am I not going to do? Sterilize. 
right? Um, so this this lack of germ theory, uh, of knowledge of, of germs is something that is going to be a great hindrance with most medicine. And, and this can sometimes still happen today. More often you're treating the symptom rather than the causes because there are still diseases that we don't fully understand the root cause of. Um, and some of these diseases have been with humans forever. Um, in fact, um, sometimes even before humans, I don't know if you're aware of this, dinosaur black cancer. Mm -hmm. Cancer is something still with humans. So when we don't know the root cause of that frequently, the only thing we can do is treat the symptoms, um, which is going to be a lot more common in this time period. Um, and going back to those home medicines, quite frequently, how are those, those remedies passed down? Or how, pardon me, how are they learned? I gave you the answer. <laughs> From generation to generation, right? So frequently we can see commonplace books, um, or if you have a family that has a, a, a recipe, a cookbook, sometimes you will see these, these remedies written down in the um, back covers um, of, of cookbooks and that sort of thing. Um, and then frequently they're passed down or, right? Um, if you don't have the, you know, if you aren't a person who can um, is functionally literate, you're going to be passing this down orally. Um, and this is one of those things that um, I usually will point out when we're talking about literacy in the past. People learn to read first, and then you might learn how to write. And when you learn to read, you're learning to read print. And when you learn to write, you're writing script. So children don't write print and then several years later learn how to write cursive kind of deal. They're learning from the beginning how to write script. Um, so you do have cases in the past of people um, uh, being able to read reading but not writing. Um, in fact, we see an account of this when Lydia Broadnaps, who was the enslaved cook of George Wythe, who was Jefferson's law professor, and she writes to Jefferson for a pair of, I heard them fall on the floor, spectacles, she asks him to send the letter back to the person that wrote the letter for her because she can read reading, but she can't read writing. Um, so we will see these, again, these sorts of things passed on, um, and they can be quite entertaining to, to read some of these. Um, and then um, that is oftentimes stuff that we might still continue today, right? So some of these home remedies um, we'll see in a bit are things that we might still continue to use today to an extent. Um, let me give this warning. No, it's, it's coming up. What makes something toxic? You can poison yourself with water. If you take what? Too much, too much of it. So the dosage of something is toxic. That's always something to remember when you're looking at treating yourself. And that's why you should always, I have this disclaimer, <laughs> seek medical, medical advice. Um, but, you know, we, we do this frequently. If, um, you can see people still um, getting uh, lavender sachets for pillows or for essential oils and that sort of thing. Things like lavender are frequently used to treat headaches and and um, and they do have other curative pro uh, properties. And this is kind of one of the, the great ones to add to a lot of dishes. This is rosemary. Um, and that uh, is also good for headaches. A lot of these are always good for headaches, it seems like. Um, and then, Fennel, um, and I won't make you regret for me here. <laughs> no, actually, um, there there are some great uh, uh, over the counter little oils that you can get, or they're not really oils; they're like mixes for children who have colic that have fennel mixed in them, um, and so that's good for for di um, digestive health and that sort of thing. 
Um, now, getting a plant to use for medicine for this time period, then, still today, what part of the plant should you use? Are you going to use the flower, the root, the leaves, the stem? There are certain plants that have safe parts and unsafe parts. For instance, um, has anyone ever heard of uh, poke salad or spring tonics? Okay, so um, in fact, where my mother-in-law is from in southeastern Kentucky, uh, in Everts County, or in Everts, Harlan County, they have a poke salad days. It is okay for you to eat those shoots of the, of the poke weed. If you eat the roots, you are going to need to call poison control. Um, and the berries will just give you a really bad stomach ache, but if you eat too many of them. So knowing which part of the plant to eat and when, or to use for medicine as when, is going to be a really paramount and important sort of thing. Um, and when we're looking at, at people coming to this area of Virginia in the 18th century, they may be coming into essentially Mars, a place that's completely unknown to them. And they might look at plants and say, well, that looks similar to, you know, this plant that I was able to use at home. And not having that knowledge could kill them. So frequently you're going to see a lot of Europeans and enslaved Africans in the new world relying on indigenous knowledge of new medicines. Now there are also plants that are being brought kind of all over the world, uh, especially with the slave trade. You will see plants travel from South America to Africa to North America and Europe. Um, but sharing this knowledge is something that's going to be important and then passing that on from generation to generation. Um, for native peoples in the Eastern Woodlands, there's usually somewhere around eight to 1200 different plants that women are going to be knowledgeable about gathering throughout the year for food, medicine, and other uses as well. Um, now, this is kind of going back to what we were saying, like, do we still use some of these things? Um, there's a lot of a lot to be said when someone's not feeling great and you make them homemade chicken noodle soup, right? Um, it's soothing. Um, and there's a possibility that there are some curative effects with it um, or help, you know, help alleviate at least your symptoms with those ailments. Um, Foxglove digitalis, um, that actually was one of those things where it was a home remedy that a doctor was was informed of, a physician in Europe was informed of, and he started publishing on the use of foxglove or digitalis for heart medicine. Um, frequently, the disease that that would treat in that time period was referred to as pleurisy. Um, I cannot remember off of the top of my head what pleurisy actually is today, um, or dropsy, um, that kind of deal. Um, willow, that's salicylic acid. Willow bark was used for treating headaches. Um, uh, but, um, you know, it's been used as pain relief. It's a little bit higher dosage when you get Tylenol or ibuprofen, pardon me, aspirin, not Tylenol, acetaminophen's different. Um, it's a little bit higher dosage with pills nowadays, but still willow bark would be used frequently. And then good old ginger um, for upset stomachs and that sort of thing. Does anyone like ginger candy when they're not when they've got a bit of an upset stomach. Yeah, it works wonders. Um, now, an important part, and I like to bring this up because we're getting ready to have that 250th uh, anniversary of the American Revolution. So when we're looking at medical advances in this time period and really other time periods as well, you're gonna see a lot of those medical advances from, again, this guy, and um, uh, the uh, probe and tourniquet um, battlefield medicine is going to be important sort of thing. So we do see a lot of advances from medicine uh, and the revolution. Um, one of the one of the big ones for the American Revolution 
is the decision by George Washington to inoculate his troops against what disease? Smallpox. Right. Now, smallpox initially uh, was discussed in Boston by Cotton Mather because he was informed by his enslaved uh, person, uh, his enslaved or his slave, Anisimus, about that practice in West Africa of taking and inoculating or taking a small bit of this of the smallpox and putting it into a cut on the arm. So that's technically called variolation. Um, it is not the same as the later vaccine that Edward Jenner comes up with, but that's the stepping stone for that. Um, because when you're looking at, this is an image from Morristown, New Jersey, that's where Washington decided ultimately to inoculate his troops against smallpox. Um, they were in dire straits at that point in the revolution as to whether or not they were going to be able to continue to fight because of a smallpox outbreak. And we see some other outbreaks as well um, uh, with troops. In fact, I'm going to go back to this image. This is a book not just about the nature and treatment of gunshot wounds, but um, uh, Baron von Steuben, who also um, helped to really train up um, the Continental troops to be able to continue to fight in the revolution. He doesn't just teach them how to drill. He teaches them how to dig latrines for sanitation um, uh, to help prevent dysentery or cholera outbreaks as well. Um, so when we're looking at the medicine and the revolution, it's not just the big things like smallpox. It's also how to keep your, your areas clean. Um, now, one example in our local area, um, this is what Barracks Road comes from mm -hmm. in Charlottesville. Um, so uh, with Burgoyne's surrender in Saratoga in 1777, Jefferson gets the idea that if those soldiers who were surrendered come to Virginia to be held as prisoners of war because they were unable, um, General Gates, who Burgoyne surrendered to, was kind of like, yeah, we'll just send some of you guys back if you promise never to fight in the revolution again. <laughs> right? And Washington and Congress are like, that's a dumb idea because they'll just re be replaced by soldiers overseas, right? Um, uh, but yeah, anyway, so there was a need to store Burgoyne's Five is it five thousand soldiers um, that are English, some Irish, and many Germans. And um, Jefferson thinks that that will be an economic boost for the Albemarle County area and the surrounding areas. Um, but their march to this area in the winter of seventeen eighty in the winter and. This, this doesn't have a good image of it. Um, most of these cabins are unfinished by the time those soldiers get here. And they're dying at immense rates every day. Okay. Um, they're, they're dying at immense rates. So it's 5,000. And I think at the end of the war, when they're fully surrendered back, is it 1,700? You go from 5,000 to 1,700. So don't quote me on those those numbers exactly. Um, and, and part of this problem is what I had mentioned earlier. There's lack of resources around. There's also immense problems with sanitation and, and that sort of thing for these soldiers. Um, these are some of the, uh, this is, um, I believe blanking here. Yeah, Crockett and the <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Crockett's uh, orderly books, which we at the museum transcribed this past winter. Um, and these are just a few of the orders relating to sickness of soldiers and, and doctors. So this is um, Dr. James Hamilton was appointed to be the surgeon's mate. Um, and that's essentially going to be an apprenticeship sort of thing in that kind of situation. Um, and then um, uh, Fort Nelson is um, uh, on the falls of the Ohio um, close to Louisville. And so this is well past uh, for Crockett's Western Battalion, pardon me, they were 
the regiment of guards for the Albemarle barracks. And when the British start getting closer into Virginia, the decision is made to march all of those soldiers away from Virginia so that the British couldn't come in release them um, and they march eventually to Shepherdstown and then to Frederick, Maryland. Um, and then once Crockett's Western Battalion leaves them in Frederickstown, they're supposed to meet up with George Rogers Clark to go and attack Fort Detroit. Um, that never pans out, but they end up basically at the at the falls of the Ohio River. Um, and this is a local Augusta County Valley state line, not continental, but not militia. It's the state line. Um, and one of the things we see here um, at Fort Nelson is whether or not there's a couple of things that you might be able to pick out here. But the main thing is um, it's uh, the uh, parade for sickness in, a, in the inability of soldiers to be able to parade because of sickness. So those that can walk still have to parade. Um, and those that can't will be excused from pain. Um, so when we're looking at medical advancements, again, for the revolution, as a result of the revolution, a big part of it is increased sanitation and hygiene um, and steps in disease control were initiated. You also see a lot more ability for battlefield treatment of the wounded, which advances surgeons' abilities. Um, again, they can't dissect, so this is their only way to study those human bodies. Um, and, you know, we're going to see a lot of these other medical advances being very far off to be able to help these sorts of folks. So I do believe that I have given myself enough time for you guys to ask questions and have any any thoughts or any uh any feelings about medicine in the past? Would you like to look at some of these things closer? We promise we won't operate on them. <laughs> <laughs> Valley, there were there were uh, people who mostly men who were called doctor. Do you have any feeling for how many of those people who who were sort of in a community they were they were consulted and and gave diagnoses and me even medicine, mostly herbal kinds of things. How many of those people were trained in any way? The f I only know for Stanton, the first trained doctor, and he he trained others as well. So he opened kind of like a small home school in a sense. Um, uh, was Alexander Humphreys, um, and then in I think it's closer to this area. Oh gosh, what is the name of the family? Um, I'm in total blank. There is a family in this area that their doctors more towards the Civil War, but it seems like they're starting early on with that with that small, uh, mostly outside of larger cities. You have kind of apprenticeships for doctors. So, in in most of those cases, those people's people are going to be training with somebody and you could sometimes make an argument that in, in many ways that's more one-on-one -on -one schooling than you got in medical school today but um but yeah that that is that is something that you would see does that answer your question yeah yeah there was a I, I don't know if this man had any training but there was a doctor he was general people and he was out here at mole hill and i don't know if that man was a was a had any training or if he just was interested and and learned on his own or it was handed down from somebody i don't know but i know he was active during the during the uh, civil war right right i was trying to think of the other, the name of the other family um the national medical the national live medical library the nih library has a shenandoah valley family papers and i'm just totally blanking on the in the name and it is that it's a family of doctors like right at the civil war and in most cases they were probably if they weren't training at an early medical college then it was more of an apprenticeship kind of thing there are some medical colleges that do eventually are throughout the colonies but it's nowhere near in the beginning what you have back in europe 
as far as that sort of thing. There also, by the way, were um, male midwives were, were mm -hmm. um, quite common mm -hmm. and controversial <laughs> um, in the in the 19th century. Um, any uh, any folk myths and based on superstitions that you run into, like you know, you know, particularly in this area, was the sort of the Germanic folks coming through. I honestly, haven't had a lot of a lot of exposure to some of those, like de like at least anything written out from from sources. Yeah, um, but folk medicine frequently. It's the same with like planting, right? Planting by the signs um, and knowing when to, you know, um, bury something in the middle of the night. Now, I will tell you the last, because sometimes this gets tied together with witchcraft trials. Um, by the 18th century, there are very few witchcraft, or there really aren't. The last witchcraft trial in Virginia is in 1720. Um, uh, now, there were quite a bit more in the early 17th century. And, and so frequently in those cases, it's where you see a woman who's treating someone. And those women are usually um, frequently older and more vulnerable in the community. Um, she wasn't a, um, she wasn't a, uh, a, from Virginia, but the, the midwife's tale, the story of Martha Ballard, um, she was in Maine. Martha Ballard was um, a, a midwife for quite a while. And then when she was relying on her son to take care of her, he did, um, he and his, his wife. So we, we frequently will see women who are widowed in these sorts of situations. Martha wasn't accused of witchcraft, but women like her often were in the 17th century. But by the 18th century, we, we see much fewer of those in Virginia. The most famous one is um, Grace Sherwood in uh, Virginia Beach area. Was that Princess El Elizabeth County? Yeah. Princess Anne yeah. County. I always Princess forget. Anne, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what Witch Duck, Witch Duck Road <laughs> is for, um, uh, if you're down in that area. Um, Grace Sherwood does appear alive quite a while after her court case. Um, a lot of Virginia court cases, too, by the way, are not early court cases are not available because of like certain documents getting either um, destroyed in Richmond during the Civil War or just fires in, in county courthouses earlier. Does Rockingham County have? They're not a burn county, are they? You are. Yes. Yeah, you are. That's right. But Augusta County is not. Right. A lot of the, a lot of documents were taken by someone to away from the courthouse, so there are some some documents that were made in Rockingham. Yeah, I know in Surrey County, the um, they have their 17th century records. Uh, if you're not familiar with Sur where Surrey County is, it's right across from Williamsburg. Their clerk of the court kept the documents hidden for quite a while. So they disappeared for a while and then were they went all them back. Off. They, they the wagon Yeah, for safe moving. For Republic or somewhere mm -hmm. when, when the courthouse was broken. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, my favorite example of that is in Williamsburg, Duke of Gloucester Street. One side of the street is York County and one side of the street is James City County. So for half of Williamsburg, they don't have the records because York County records are not burnt, but James City County records are. Like, yeah, when you're searching for documentation on family members like genealogy or just court records or, or primary source records in, and we do see documents, court documents showing up about medical treatment or you know, any any variety of these sorts of things and chancery courts too that are not always entirely available. So have to sometimes get creative with your historic sources. Well, I will be up here. And if you have any any desire to come out and check out some of the herbs that we brought, um, we have the, you know, the really um, uh, Scarborough Fair herbs, the rosemary, <laughs> thyme, sage, and parsley. Um, but also some some little more unusual ones. Um, uh, this is a little bit of borage, um, whorehound. Um, anyone ever had whorehound candy? Sure. Mm -hmm. Great for coughs um, and that sort of thing. So, a question. Yes. So we know aloe. Everybody uses it. I'm assuming that was not native here. Wow. I usually know my plant stuff. 
I don't. Know. No, just I don't think it is. The people who work with me will tell you I usually know my plants. Um, mm-hmm. One that is, it's not like aloe. Um, uh, like the one that always surprises people is yucca is a native plant. But mm-hmm. I don't know about aloe. Yucca's native here. Oh wow! That's native, surprising. yeah. There's a western and an eastern um, yucca right. all over the United States. So to the Mississippi and then Mississippi over. Interesting. Didn't look like it would be a plant that would have it. No, it here. So, um, and and speaking of plants that are native or not native, um, one of the uh, earliest things that you'll see both in Roanoke and Jamestown are um, kind of naturalists, but people who are also looking for for plants to be used for medical and or um, economic benefit in in early colonies. And that would be something that you would see continuing out here. People are going to be looking for those things that can make money and help people. Ginseng. And it grossed everyone out too much? (laughs) No. Next time.